Now he's ready. Uh, we're going to start uh, on Thursday nights going through the book of Hebrews. There are really people that are afraid of the book of Hebrews. There are some things in there that they don't understand, so it just freaks them out. There's some real misunderstanding about the book of Hebrews because it was written to who? The Hebrews. The Hebrews. And then we, people want to fight about who wrote it. But Some people say Luke and some say Paul. Uh, I say God wrote it, so no matter whose hand he used. Amen? Uh, but the real thing is, is that we, we see some great theological work done in the book of Hebrews. So we want to take it uh, a, a chapter at a time. I don't know if I'll make it all the way through the chapter, but we'll get through part of it. Amen? And look at it. Uh, in Hebrews 1, in the King James Version, which I don't do that a lot, but we'll do in the King James. I remember years ago, we had some people start at the church, and I was teaching in the New King James like I generally do now, or the Amplified, and, and they came up to me, and they said, we'd like to have a meeting with you. I said, okay. And they said, you know, there's no other real Word of God but the King James. I said, Really? So you really think that when God spoke, he said thus and thee and all that kind of stuff. Is that what you're thinking? But at any rate, so I said, so I thought, if you'll find me a really good wide margin Bible, because I did a whole lot of street preaching back then, a wide margin Bible means you want to put some notes or something, you, you hold your Bible, read scripture, and read notes. So anyway, good wide margin Bible, good one. In, in, in key, yeah, it's floppier. And king james version i said i'll preach out of it and very next sunday here they come with a brand new bible with my name on it and king james so i preached out of the king james again for years and then when they left the church i switched around now i preach whatever i believe is going to say it best you know but hebrews in the first chapter father we thank you in the mighty name of jesus we thank you for your word it is like a two-edged sword it cuts between the marrow and the bone, between the spirit and the soul. It's a discerner of our hearts. We, we thank you, Lord, for this word because we don't care about following cunningly devised fables, but we know that the men of old wrote what they wrote under the unction of the Holy Spirit. And so we here today are here today just to hear what you would say to us, Lord, in our our hearts, our minds are open to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. In the book of Hebrews, as in the book of Genesis, you have absolutely no quarrels about who this Bible is about. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it try to prove its own existence? It also doesn't try to prove God's existence. It expects for us and the rest of the world to understand that there is a God. The Bible even says this. It said it's a fool who said in his heart that there is no God. Psalm 14, I'm going to read this to you. I love this in the first few verses. Uh, it says, the empty-headed fool... I think I put this in the Amplified, but the empty-headed fool. Somebody say empty-headed. I've, I've met a few of those. I have been that. But anyway, the empty-headed fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable deeds. There is none that does good or right. Remember, this same scripture is quoted in the book of Romans. There's none that does right. They are all gone aside. They have all together become filthy. There is none that does good or right. No, not one. Ha have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord? There they, they, there they shall be in great fear, literally dreading a dread. For God is with the generation of the uncompromisingly righteous, those upright and right standing with him. That's us, ain't it? Amen. So he starts out talking about who? God. Somebody say God. That's what this is about. That's what everything is about. After you get at the end of all of our programs and everything, all the things that we do, it's about that. Who at sundry times and in diverse manners, God will do whatever it takes to get his message out. 
He's always been that. Sundry times does not really speak of a time. There are two Greek words there. I'm not giving you both of them, but the, the, at sundry times and divers matters are two Greek words that work together. Sundry times doesn't speak of time as we know it. The emphasis here is God spoke through Moses, but before that he spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Abraham through dreams and by sending the angel of the Lord to him. But when he spoke to Ab Abraham, he did not tell him what he told Moses. God didn't say anything at all to Abraham about the law. He didn't give him the Ten Commandments. In different ages, he had different messages that he wanted to bring forth. We'll study a little bit later, uh, I mean Sunday, about the seven dispensations of time. But before that, he spoke to Abraham. He, he spoke to Abraham through dreams. Uh, he didn't talk to him about the law. He didn't give him the Ten Commandments. But later, God did give the Ten Commandments to Moses at sundry times. He's not really talking about periods of time. He's talking about from the very beginning, he had different messages for different people to bring forth. Later on, he told David that a king would be coming in his line who'd be a savior. And when David was an old man, he said that there was a king coming in his line who would be the savior. God did not give that information to Moses, and he did not give it to Abraham. Right now, we understand that we have revelation they never had. Sunday, we'll talk about the, the, uh, um, uh, those things that were mysteries in the Old Testament that are revealed in the New Testament. In fact, they weren't even re some of those were not even revealed while Jesus walked this earth. When Jesus walked this earth, he still had to teach under the confines of the law. He had to do that because he was the last prophet, prophet of that Old Testament. Divers manners. What does that mean? It means that God used different ways of communicating. He appeared in dreams to Abraham. He gave Moses the law. Later on, he made certain promises to Joshua. He spoke through dreams. He spoke through the law. He spoke through types. He spoke through shadows. He spoke through ritual. He spoke through history. He spoke through poetry. He spoke through prophecy. The truth about it is, is that he had different ways to get that message out. There were many people that did not. They, people think everybody didn't, but some people understood when they made blood sacrifices what it was really about. And, and they could do that in faith, looking forward. But many people didn't understand when they made blood, blood sacrifice that it was really picture a picture of Christ that would come and take away the sins of the world. The other word I like in that verse is said that God spoke. Somebody say God speaks. God still speaks today. He hasn't changed his way. He's not done talking to people. He has to talk to us. And he not only talks to us, I've heard people say, well, he talks through this word. Yes, he talks more than this word. He confirms the word with signs and wonders. But what else does he do? He talks to us by revelation. He talks by the Holy Ghost. He talks by inner witness. He talks through modern-day prophets. He has a lot of ways to get the word to us. God spoke. And he still speaks. He spoke in the old to the prophets. Matthew 4, 4, remember, Jesus was being tempted. And uh, when he was being tempted, he replied, it's been written, man shall not live. This is in the Amplified. I keep jumping around, making it harder for the guy. Man shall not live and be upheld and sustained by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. That's what really matters. Can I really tell, be honest with you? Yours and my opinion means very little. I had an interesting discussion the other day. I'm not even going to go into all of that. But an interesting discussion in the hospital. I went to go pray for a guy. And uh, one of the people that was inside of the room had some real doubts about it all. So I treated him with great love. But I knew that the Word of God would speak more than my opinion. So I quoted the Word to him. Well, this is what the Bible says. Well, here's what I think, yes, but here's what the Bible says. Did you know that God will never change his mind about something just because you don't agree with his way? He's never going to turn around someday and say, you know what, if I'd have thought about that, I'd have done it that way. But I never thought about that. Thank you for bringing that up. God's all-knowing. He knows what's going on. 
And he knows what he needs to do. Amen. It said that, that in divers ways, in, in manners, what did he do? He spoke, and he still speaks. And who did he speak to? It says in time past unto the fathers. Say the fathers. Not our fathers. Unless you're Jewish in this room. Amen. He spoke to the fathers. What did it mean? Spake in time past into the fathers. What does that mean? Well, the fathers are mentioned uh, in another place. They're, they're Abraham. Which ones are they? Who's the fathers? This is a book to who? The Hebrews. So they're Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Moses, David, Isaiah, and all like that. The, they're the fathers of the Hebrew faith. That's what they are. Obvious, obviously, this has been written to those people. And he says he spoke how? By the prophets. By the prophets. A prophet in the New Testament uh, is not somebody who necessarily speaks a prophecy because there are people that come forth with a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom uh, or any kind of a prophecy. They can come forth by divine revelation. But a true prophet, a modern-day prophet, will speak in consistent divine revelation. Amen? Now, I want to tell you right now, there are a lot of people that call themselves prophet this and prophet that. And all they're really doing is profiting. Amen? But even the Old Testament, a prophet is one who speaks for God in the Old Testament. In the order of speaking for God, he could speak things that were in the future. But did you know he was a primary way in the Old Testament that people heard from God? They had to have a prophet. Now, we use that word a little bit different, but if you'll look, there's about, I, I, I think there's something like 30-some prophets mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, not just the main ones that you see, Isaiah, you know. And, but God spoke to many men who were prophets, and they were tremendous men with tremendous messages. It took all of them together to make the Old Testament that we have. God has spoken finally, though, through his Son. Verse 2. He hath in this last day spoken to us by his Son. Somebody say, I love Jesus. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Last days. You know uh, you, how often you hear people say, we're in the last days. Well, we've been in the last days since Christ was here. That's why he said he's spoken in these last days by his son. Amen. He's spoken to us by his son. He's let in these last days. The words is so important that God wasn't, uh, 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 couldn't just rely upon the Old Testament prophets to give us the word. That was never his plan. His plan was to send his Jesus, his son Jesus, even before the foundation of the earth. He had this plan. Uh, many times God is shown as being just kind of reacting, well, man did this, so now I'm going to have to do this. Uh, that God had a plan from the very beginning. Uh, as we said before in Ephesians 1, he, he ordained that we'd be holy and unblameable in his sight before he ever created this world. But he's spoken to us through the prophets in the Old Testament. To who? Then. Hebrew believers. Say Hebrew believers. You know, do you remember, uh, uh, and when he spoke, we as Gentiles, we get the overflow of that now, don't we? Amen. But I remember when, uh, uh, when he was identified, the, the love of God. This whole story is about Jesus and what he would do. Our great creator, our great savior, our great healer. This whole story, this whole Bible that, that, that uh, one time I was preaching, and as I was preaching, I didn't even notice that I was hugging this Bible. And somebody said afterwards, you hug that Bible through that whole sermon. And I said, I'll probably hug it a whole lot more because this, uh, man, this, this, this is God's love letter to mankind. It isn't a letter of condemnation. Everything in this word was about saving man. Amen? It's a letter of love. Turn to somebody and say, this is his letter of love. He even spoke out of the heavens to identify his son. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So the truth about it is, is that we needed to hear, we needed to hear from Jesus. He spoke in the prophets in old in the past, 
and sundry times and different ways and all kinds of ways to get the word across. But the truth about it is now we hear ye him. Now we listen to Jesus because now the son is our word. Since the father has given his final word, it ought to be something we hear, isn't it? Amen. Can I, I, I've said this before, and sometimes people misunderstand me about it, uh, but sometimes I just get sick to death of listening to preaching and preaching myself. I feel like we just preach until there's no more breath. Amen? It is the foolishness of preaching. And I get done preaching a sermon or teaching it, and I'll say, okay, I've taught verse by verse, God, and yet I still don't feel we got the got the message across therefore what he's trying to say through this and actually through the whole book of hebrews he's trying to get a message over to the hebrew people he's trying to let the jews know one thing you know what that is christ is superior to the law to the old way well, that's the point of it he's superior to the old testament writers sure it is true that's the reason he said it like that that's the reason it's written that way that's the reason it says in time past they spoke to the prophets. Oh, but now he's spoken to us by his son. The strength is in knowing that it, the son has a message for God's people. Amen? He fulfills all of the Old Testament. He fulfills all the types and the shadows and everything that the Old Testament taught. The Old Testament writers were looking forward to Christ, but now Christ is here and he's spoken. He, the Holy Spirit, we're even told that uh, over 19, over 2,000 years ago now, that he, the Holy Spirit, shall take of mine and uh, shall show it unto you, John 16, 15. He's going to take the things of Christ and show it to us. He made a lot of promises in John 14 through 16. You know that? That that comforter would not only sh teach us what Jesus, would reveal to us what Jesus was saying, but he would teach us about things to come. Then it goes on in that verse that said, Jesus is the heir of all things. Uh, uh, we know that. John 1, 3 says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This thing centers on Jesus. Somebody was teasing me the other day. They said, you know, you'd have more money if you was one of those TV evangelists. I said, I might have more money if I was a TV evangelist, but I wouldn't have more peace. Because I've spent my life, whether doing it well or not, I don't know, but I've spent my life trying to focus upon Jesus and all that he's done. It's about Jesus. It's not really about heart of God. It's not about Bob Caps or any other speaker or any of the preachers we got here or any other preacher on earth. That one preacher that came forth, hmm, the Son of God, it's all about Him. It's all about Him. Creation is His. Talk about His inheritance. Creation is His. Why? He created it. It belongs to Him already. So why in the world would He say it's His inheritance? There is something. There is something that is an, an inheritance to God, to Jesus, that He gets just because of His sacrifice upon that cross. There is something that God doesn't have until we give him, and that's us. Until we get to that place, we say, Lord, I'm tired of trying to do things on my own. He had control of nature, the wind and the waves. He could multiply food. He could curse a fig tree. He could heal a leper. He could heal the blinded eyes. He could heal the lame man, tell him to get up and walk. He could do all of that, but he couldn't force his way into the heart of a man. Man had to willingly give his life to him. He's the heir of all things. Romans 8, 16 says it like, 17 says it like this. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. It's a beautiful thing to know that all that, create, that God has is mine. Say that. All that God has is mine. We're joint heirs. 
He owns it all. But listen, if, if Christ lives in you, the greatest lesson we can learn, one of the greatest lessons is that if I'm in Christ and Christ is in me, then the things that Christ has and, and the power that Christ has is also where? In us. He's the creator. He uses the term in that one scripture, by whom also he made the worlds. That's a pretty interesting word. We've discussed that in another place in, 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 uh, in Hebrews. We'll see that word in the 11th chapter, what we call the faith chapter of Hebrews. But it, but it doesn't refer to planets when it says created those worlds. The Greek word for worlds is ion, and it means ages. He made the ages. This goes way beyond just being the creator. It's, it lends, it, it brings about this idea that everything he does has purpose and that everything he created had purpose. He made the ages giving purpose to everything. He not only created everything, he did it for a reason. The Bible makes sense, doesn't it? God had a reason for the things he did. In the Amplified, that verse says it like this. But in the last of these days, he has spoken to us in the person of a son, whom he appointed heir and lawful owner of all things, also by and through, through him who created the worlds and the reaches of space and the ages of time, he made, produced, built, operated, and arranged them in order. This is about Jesus. I don't want to make anybody angry, but I'm not allowed as a Christian to believe in every God. I'm only allowed to believe in one God. Now, through the person of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen? If I were a Muslim, I would be called on to believe in Allah and the teachings of the prophet, of what they call the prophet Muhammad. I would be called upon to study the Quran. But I am a Christian. And so I believe what the Bible says. I believe when the Bible says there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, nobody comes to the Father but by me, and nobody comes unless the Spirit calls. And I believe that that's true. There's not another way. The third verse says, being the brightness of his glory, this is a description of our Lord and our Savior. I love this. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, and by the way, that's the only purgatory he's talked about in the Bible. Jesus is the only one that purged sin. You can't buy that. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on our high, who being the brightness of his glory, who being the brightness of brightness means the outshining. If you want to know what the outshining of God, the thing that showed the greatest glory of God, it was his son, Jesus Christ. And it says in the express image of his person. That word express image is the Greek word character which we get the word character from. It is the impressed character. It's like carving it in stone or burning it in steel. We say that the Lord Jesus Christ is the revelation of God, but why do we say that? Because he is God. There are people that go like this. They'll say, I would love to know I would love to know what God is like. Well, if you want to know what God is like, look at his son. Because he is the, he, he, he is the image of the Father. Uh, if you want to know how good God is, see how good Jesus was. If you want to know how compassionate the Father is, then see how compassionate his son was. If you want to know whether or not God is a healer, look and see what Jesus did. Those people in this day and age that, that don't believe that, that uh, who actually believe that maybe God brings sickness to teach people things, uh, they're greatly mistaken because if God brought sickness upon people, then Jesus came against the Father every time he healed somebody. 
Jesus is the healer, and he's the image of God. If you want to know how much God loves you, look at Jesus who is willing to lay down his life so that we could have eternal life. And by the way, I want to say this to the church right now. You know, the greatest thing the church has to uh, offer people is still salvation. It still is. I'm glad I'm saved, baptized in the Holy Ghost. I, I'm glad the gifts are here. I'm glad of all that. But the greatest thing that we have and to share is that Jesus died for your sins and that you can have eternal life. And I don't have to work for eternal life. I don't know about you, but I'm glad of that. Colossians 2.9 says it even a little bit more. Oh, hold on a second. Colossians 2.9 says here, this. I, I love this statement because uh, uh, it says more about who Jesus was than many of the statements. In Colossians 2.9, it says, In him, talking about Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You see how powerful that is? Kathy said powerful, extremely powerful. Everything God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, everything that the Godhead is, is, was in Jesus. Well, what does that mean if Jesus lives in you? Boy, I'm so tired of teaching that, that leaves people uh, poor, broke, busted, disgusted, stupid, barely making it through, hoping someday Jesus will return so they can rescue them. Jesus has already rescued us. I'm looking forward to the rapture, but I want to tell you, everything that God is dwells in you. God is not somehow fragmented, so there's a little bit of God in one and a little bit of God in another. Everything that God is, God lives in you. Everything that God is lives in you. And that means the big problem that man has isn't whether or not God will come and dwell in him. Uh, he's already taken care of that. The big problem with man is, is can he get a revelation of that and then allow that God to operate through him? What will happen then? I called a gal in, uh, in uh, well, the head of, not the head, but the secretary for our organization down in, in Dallas, and I said, can you get somebody to go pray for a gal that's extremely sick, a minister that's down there? And she said, yeah, I'll get so-and-so and her husband. And I said, well, awesome. Do you know them? She goes, I know them real well. Uh, he was dying of cancer. She prayed for him, and he was totally restored. Uh, they just went over and prayed for another gal who was brain dead, and they pulled the plug on her. They prayed for him, and that gal is up and well and operating fine. And they said they, they're just, uh, they have great faith, and they operate in great faith. Did you know that, that when they prayed for those people, they didn't have to wait for God to come out of the heavens to heal them because King David said, where can I go where your, where your spirit isn't? If I descend into the depths, you're there. If I ascend into heaven, you're there. Wherever I go, that's where you are. And everything that God is dwells in us. Then he uses that term, upholding all things by the word of his power. He holds all things together by the word of his power. Did you know if Jesus wasn't as loving as he uh, is, in the same way that he said, light be, he could have said, no more light. He could say, the molecules inside of you are not going to stay together anymore, and we would just, I know it looks like mine have been expanding already, but in case any of you were thinking that. But the truth about it is, is that, uh, uh, that, that everything would disappear by a decision by our Lord and Savior, but he loves us. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He not only created it by his word, but he holds everything together. And I love this thing. When he had himself purged our sins. If you miss Sunday's message, you missed a message. Because you couldn't come out after that message Sunday and not understand that God has already taken care of this thing. If you did miss it, go to heartofgodfellowship.com and watch it or get a CD. And after he took care of our sins, in other words, after he shed his blood, not the blood of bulls and goats, but he shed his own blood 
upon that cross. And when he went into the heavenlies, and he went into the heavenlies and he put his blood upon that mercy seat in heaven that the one on earth was just a copy of, it forever sealed those that are. He made us, it tells us in, in uh, uh, Hebrews 10.10, 10, that he made us holy. He made us righteous. He made us holy. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. He healed us by the work of the cross. He purged us of our sins by the work of the cross. He saved us. He enabled us to be a, a, a vessel by purging us of our sins and cleansing us completely. I want you to get a hold of this. He made us a vessel that the Holy Spirit could live in. Somebody said, I don't think I've been purged of all my sins. Then the Holy Ghost couldn't live in you. But the Holy Ghost can live on the inside of us. Amen. He can fill us over. He did all of that by the work of that cross. Now, if a person doesn't walk in that salvation, that's not God's fault. If they don't walk in the healing, that's not God's fault. Amen? If they don't walk in holiness, is that God's fault? No. He's provided all that. So after he purged us of our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I love this because one of the things it tells us it's, a, it's about like Genesis when he rested on, that, on the seventh day. Uh, did, he, did God rest on the seventh day because he was plumb tuckered out? Is that why he rested? No. No, God doesn't tire. We know that because the Bible tells us in Isaiah 40, he doesn't tire, not weary, not wore out. Amen? We get that way. But if we'll tap into God, we can... We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and will not faint. For the Lord will go before us and his joy will be our strength. Okay, I'm stopping. Sat down right hand of the majesty on high. There's something in heaven today. There's something in heaven there, can I tell you that, that has never existed there. Never there's something in heaven that's never existed there before. A man. A man with a body with holes in his hands and a hole in his side. That never existed. A man with nail-pierced hands in heaven. Twenty-five hundred years ago or so, he was God, but today he's in heaven as a God-man. When you stop and think that, it's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? He sat down. He didn't sit down because he was tired. He sat down because he said on the cross, it's finished. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now watch this. It's like a... It's like a scripture about what we believe here. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. If I'm in Christ, am I complete? Yes. In him. I'm complete. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm complete. We are made complete in him. We are made full in him. We are accepted in in the beloved. I remember a time in my life, there's no way that I would let words like, because I had to be the tough guy, I'd never let words go out like, man, I'm head over heels in love with Jesus. I can't even imagine having said that. You know. Man, having somebody say, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm just in love with him. Mm. I remember one time I shocked one of my friends and, uh, uh, and I said, I'm so in love with Jesus. I just, I want to consummate this relationship. And I thought they were going to fall out, but dwell on it a while. I'm in him and he's in me and I want to be closer and closer to him. Does that make sense? Verse 4 says, being made so much better than the angels. Have you ever wondered why in the world they'd say he was better than angels? Now, I'm not talking about, you and I both know that Christ is better than angels. 
But why did they have to say that to the letter of the Hebrews? Because they exalted angels. Being made so much better than angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. Being made so much better than angels. The Lord Jesus, as the God-man, is far above every name. The Hebrews didn't know what to do about that. That was something they didn't understand. He shows the superiority of Christ over Moses. Do you have any understanding of the audacity of Jesus saying this? It is written... Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you, for him to stand in front, the, uh, front of the religious leaders of that day who exalted Moses, for him to stand in front of them and say, I know it's written this, but let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that's a deeper understanding of that. Jesus was higher above all those names. He meant more than Moses or, or any other mediator. He, uh, 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 you couldn't go back far enough. And I think that's one of the reasons that the writer does this. He's far greater than angels. How far back would you have to go? Once you said he's far greater than angels, you pretty much covered it. Angels are described as, and this was tough for the Hebrew children to hear, hear even at that time. The Hebrew Christians even, there were, it's tough for them to hear. Angels are described as excelling in strength. And because of that, they were raised uh, higher than what men. Uh, 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 in order to establish Christ's superiority over everything, they'd have to say he was above angels. He was also saying by saying that, that Christianity is over Judaism. That's a big old statement. He was teaching them, you know, you, uh, you think what you believe is great, but I'm going to tell you there's something greater. Jesus' name is far above Moses and angels and everything else. And then he was saying that Christ was superior over the angels. Let, let, let me tell you why that was tough for them. I'm going to go through just a few things. There was the angel of the covenant, Ma Malachi 3.1. The angel of the Lord, Exodus 3.2. Some of these, I believe, was the pre-incarnate Christ. The angel of the Lord who delivered Hagar in Genesis 16.7 and who appeared to Abraham. Angels delivered Lot in Genesis 19.1. It was the Lord's angel who protected Israel in the Passover night in Numbers 20 and 16. Jews esteemed angels more highly than that, being made so much better than angels. Angels are the highest of all God's cre created creatures. Heaven is their native home, it says in Matthew 24, 36. They excel in strength. They're God's ministers in Psalms 104. I was going to read this to you, Psalm 104. I guess I don't have to get any further than what we get tonight. I don't have a watch. It's a goal of mine to have one. Do what? Oh, I don't care? Okay, I didn't know that. I forgot what I was looking for. Oh, yeah, Psalm 104. This is really interesting, and we're going to get back to it in a minute, but the, the, it says that they're God's ministers, uh, but I'm going to read you a little something challenging, so I just want to turn, so I can turn back to it in a little bit. They're called holy in Matthew 25, 31. Their countenances are like lightning and their raiment white as snow, Matthew 28, 3. They surround God's throne in, in Revelation 5, 11. But it said, by inheritance, he obtained a more excellent name than those angels. Do you see what that meant to them? Because there was nothing higher to them uh, but God himself. To be to say something was higher than it. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Let's say that. The name that's above every name. 
You know what? That is another one of those statements, isn't it? That we can easily say, but do we really, does our life reflect that? When somebody gives us a name of a disease, do we say that name like it's high above Jesus? Because we know that if somebody, if the doctor says you have cancer, we need to believe that Jesus is a higher name than cancer. That in that name of, uh, of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? We have finally had our banner come in because I'm going to teach on uh, the timeline of man from the beginning to the end. Uh, not in one sermon, obviously. And uh, I think it'll really, uh, I think it'll really bring you great comfort. Uh, and it says that every tongue frankly and openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even the devil himself, though he'll be cast into a lake of fire. Can I tell you this? He's going to have to confess that God, uh, that Jesus is Lord. We always joke about it, but I'd love to do it. I wish that the devil, did you know the Bible says in Psalms that we're going to be surprised to see who the devil really is? He's nothing. Number five, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I'll be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's verse five. For under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. Let me go ahead and ask you that. If you look in the scriptures, he never called an angel my son. And the writer's really trying to let the Hebrew children know this. You may as well quit talking about angels. Angels is not the thing. The Lord Jesus was at his baptism and at his transfiguration, and what did the Father say? This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. To which of the angels did God ever say, You're my Son? It says in the Amplified, Today I have begotten you. Can I tell you that if there was one verse or part of a verse that theologians have argued about forever it's that one verse when he says today i have begotten you now would you like to know why they argue about it they argue about it because they say christ has always existed and he has jesus always existed the son always existed but he said today i have begotten you well, he is talking about the virgin birth. He's talking about, I've begotten you here on this earth. It teaches us of that virgin birth. His humanity was begotten by God the Father. Then he says in verse 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten of the world, he saith, And let the angels of God worship him. If angels were higher than Christ, they wouldn't worship him. But the angels of God are wonderful. They're, they're just inferior to the Son of God. They're his angels. They're his ministers, and they're his worshipers. They worship him. He does not worship them. And of the angels, I walked into a woman's house one time. She goes, uh, look it, I want you to see my collection of angels. And I knew they were just cute little things, nothing terrible. Just, you know, when I grew up around my grandma, she had this one cabinet with glass front that was for whatnot. All kinds of little shiny glass figurines that were in there. I'm not telling you I understood it. But when you're a little child, you love looking at all those, you know, and seeing them. Now, don't break that. Yeah, this probably cost you 28 cents at Woolworth, you know what I'm saying? But anyway. And of the angels, he saith, and this is what I want to get to in Psalms 104, because this is an odd, odd verse. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. What a weird thing. Because this is a quotation out of Psalms 104. And, uh, uh, and I want to read this to you. Uh, and 104.4, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. Now, you know, I've always taught you to take things in context. 
You know what I'm saying? And uh, so I want to read this. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light with a, a gar as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, uh, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers of flame of fire. Let me show you some other translation. Uh, Psalm 1, in the Living Bible, the angels are his messengers, his servants of fire. In Psalms 104, 4, in God's word, to make your angels winds and your servants flames of fire. But here is the New International Version. I'm going to read this to you. He makes winds his messengers and flames his servants. Is there a world of difference between all of those? Now, would you like the Bob Capps version of it? I think, they I think that the, the writer of Hebrews is merely trying to say this right here, that God uses these angels in the same way that he would use winds or fire or anything else. He does with his angels a mighty and tremendous things, and yet God has exalted Jesus even higher. And I think that's the point he's trying to make because the very next verse in Hebrews says, but under the sun, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. That's tremendous, isn't it? Go ahead, say it, Pastor. You're not going to get done with this. We're not going to make it through this. Not going to make it through this. That is an exact quote from Psalms 45, 6, and 7. And Psalms 45 tells us there's one coming in the line of David who will rule in righteousness. Uh, my tongue, he says in Psalms 45, 1, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. David's saying, I could tell you about this much better than I could write about it. He was so excited about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. Amen. Uh, God's not given the right to rule the earth to any angel. He's not doing that. I'm going to read you Colossians 2, 11 through 19 in the message version uh, just to show this, uh, this thing about angels. If it's in, here, uh, let me go ahead and tell you this. There are times that people say, I wonder why he spent so much time on such a little subject. Do you think he would have spent all that time if it was a little subject? He spent all of that time because it was one of the most important things to the Hebrews to exalt angels to that place. In, uh, now watch this in Colossians 2, 11 through 19 in the message version. Entering to this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in, insiders. Not through some secretive initiation rite, but rather through what Christ has already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. If it's an, if it's an initiation ritual you're after, you've already been through it by submitting to baptism. Going under the water was a burial of your old life. Coming out was, of it was a resurrection. God raising you from the dead as he did Christ. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it. All sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. So don't put up with anyone pressuring you in details of diet, worship services, or holy days. All those things are mere shadows cast before what was to come. The substance is Christ. Don't tolerate people who try to run your life, ordering you to bow and scrape, insisting you that, now watch this, insisting that you join their obsession with angels. Must have been a pretty big problem back then, you reckon? Insisting that you join their obsession with angels and that you seek out visions. Let me go ahead and answer that right now. Don't seek out visions. 
When God is going to give you a vision, he'll give you a vision. There are a lot, and here's what he says about people who try to get you to move in those directions. There are a lot of hot air. That's all they are. They're completely out of touch with the source of life, Christ, who puts us together in one piece, whose very breath and blood flow through us. He's the head. We're the body. We can grow up healthy in God only as he nourishes us. Is that good stuff? Amen. Amen. That's all the further we're going to do. I'll finish that chapter next week. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. Let's just raise our hands. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Oh, Jesus, that name above all names. Oh, Jesus, we give you praise and honor and glory. We just praise you today. We are not allowing ourselves to be drawn aside by this weird teaching or that weird teaching or by worship.